evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us at, at our farm and our tonight. I'm so happy to see so many friendly faces again. And I wanted to begin uh, with a celebration of our new uh, improved vision statement that we just completed this week at Practical Farmers of Iowa. And you can feel free to, to enjoy reading this on your own. Uh, it's a wonderful organization to work for. I'm very proud to, to have such great uh, folks uh, and great farmers to work for and such great friends, friends of farmers, too, that uh, believe in this, this shared vision that is, that is really what, what really drives, drives us long term uh, at Practical Farmers of Iowa. So I want to share that with you, and we're very proud to, to announce this to the world. We are in our third, right in the middle of our uh, Spring Farm in our series, and we are very happy to, to have these available by recording, and you can, you can access those on our website. And I want to also thank our supporters, uh, the Farm Aid and Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program uh, of the USDA. These grants make it possible to pay, pay our farmers um, for their knowledge, for sharing their knowledge. And I wanted to really uh, thank those, those groups for their funds. And additionally, I think the Series Foundation has been a really big supporter of our horticulture programming. And I uh, just want to acknowledge those, those or organizations that, that help us do our work. We've, uh, we've got a great lineup uh, this whole rest of the spring, every week, and on Tuesday evenings. We've got uh, these 90-minute seminars, and so I really want to encourage you all to keep coming back and uh, bring your friends and share the announcements with your, your group of peers. And uh, so without any further ado, let's, let's begin. A little more uh, background about uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa. We are 26 years old now as an organization, and our, our, our most recent draft of our mission statement that we just passed this week at the board meeting uh, included uh, some more some little tweaks, and I'll read, just read the mission here. The Practical Farmers of Iowa is, a, is an open, supportive, and diverse organization advancing profitable, ecologically sound, and community-enhancing approaches to agriculture through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. It's a great group to be with, and I'm really proud uh, of the work that we do, and out of all of our members, over 1,700 individuals across the, the state. And uh, these are some of our values here. We are a grassroots sustainable agriculture organization, organization and uh, we believe in, in these, these values that uh, we all hold, um, and we really are proud of these things that we, that we hold together. And I uh, just wanted to make a couple announcements. That if, you, if you agree with what you've seen on the screen tonight, if you agree with uh, that vision and the, the, the whole concept of widespread ownership and diverse farms across the country, uh, you should be a, a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa. Uh, you can uh, join online. You can donate online. And uh, those, you know, we need to work together in this world to, to really make big impacts. And I really think that... Uh, Together, as an organization, we, we are much stronger than we are as individuals. So I really encourage you to join as well if you're not a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa. And also, just to let you know, we do have a full uh, offering of online seminars that are archived and recorded, so you can uh, access those. Uh, if you missed one or two, you can access those online in our archive library, practicalfarmers.org slash farminar. At the office, we are busy, busy, busy working setting up research projects on farm with farmers, over 70 research projects, uh, cooperators, excuse me, last year. And a uh, very full suite of research, again, to test a uh, uh, full suite of, of research priorities that our farmers choose. We're working on a field day lineup to include uh, 20 or more uh, on-farm field days with farmers sharing uh, their ex expertise and, and knowledge from their farms. We're writing more grants and fundraising to help uh, achieve our, our members' goals and priorities. And uh, our branding workshop is coming up, a great opportunity to, to spend a little more time focused on your marketing and, and getting, getting some brand concepts uh, solidified for your organization or your uh, farm. And uh, it's a great opportunity to, to really market yourself and, and be competitive in the marketplace uh, with, uh, with better marketing. If you're interested in learning more about that, uh, email sally at practicalfarmers.org. Additionally, if you've got youth, you know, folks that are b below the, the age of 18, 18 and under, uh, who would like to participate in our, in our research and demonstration, we have many grants uh, in the amount of 50 to $250 to uh, award this year to uh, various uh, youth projects that want to showcase a different research question. Uh, it could be about food, it could be about farming, 
a very open, uh, a full range of possibilities. And we really encourage uh, youth members, uh, youth folks, to, to definitely apply. The due date for that is April 15th. So without any further uh, further visiting uh, from my end, I'd like to really, with a, with a warm welcome and a big thank you uh, to uh, Elizabeth Henderson uh, to visit tonight about uh, the topics of CSA members as partners. And we are just really thrilled to have her. And we've uh, she's a very uh, well-known uh, known individual and, and really well-respected. And uh, I'm just really honored to present uh, Elizabeth Henderson to you all tonight to share her thoughts on this topic. Elizabeth, I'll, I'll pick up your PowerPoint here, and we can begin. Thank you. Good evening. I'm really honored to have been invited to present one of your seminars. And one of the first things I did after discovering them was to tell all the beginning farmer people who are working on projects here in the Northeast that they can access your seminars themselves from your website. And probably we have materials that you can use, too. So I think if we all work together on this, we will have the most incredible farmer training materials that um, one could hope for. So I'm seeing on my Zoom uh, the first picture. That's wonderful. Okay, this, this beautiful vision is what I see out the window of my house. And it represents for me um, one of the great benefits that we have working in small family scale agriculture, AG, aesthetic gluttony. Um, I have to apologize to you for being a little slow in clicking on additional images, because uh, last Tuesday I broke my wrist and it was operated on this morning, and so I'm working with my left hand. <clears throat> but I wanted to start by talking a little bit about one of the IFOAM principles. IFOAM is the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. Uh, there are over 700 member organizations in over 100 countries around the world, and IFOAM has um, been working on organic standards and the meaning of organic for many years. And one of the basic principles of organic agriculture is the principle of fairness. And from this principle, one can easily get to the idea of community-supported agriculture with people who are loyal customers of a farm, becoming much more, becoming more like what um, Carlo Petrini of Slow Food talks about as co-producers with the farmer. But what's been interesting in learning more about the history of CSA, our farm was one of the first um, in New York State. And this next year will be our 23rd year of doing community-supported agriculture. Am I still muffled? Can you hear me better? Um, the basic principle, what, what characterizes a community-supported agriculture plan and makes it different from other kinds of marketing is that the people who are the customers agree to share the risk with the farmers. So if the weather is better, they get a little more. If the weather is worse, they might get less. Every season, they might get a slightly different mix of product. But they are sharing the risk with the farmers, and there isn't any other form of marketing in which people do that. And I have taken community-supported agriculture as being what Robin Van En, who was the first person doing it in this country, set out to do is to create an antidote to the worst um, difficulties for farmers of doing conventional agriculture in this country, where people receive products, payment for products that doesn't cover the cost of production, um, where farmers are overworked, 
where they provide service, but it's not particularly appreciated by members of the community. And in community-supported agriculture, you are attracting people to your farm who care about what you are doing and who, if you ask them and involve them, will do a great deal with you. Amazing amounts of contributions will come to your farm if you're not too shy to say, this is a project that we can all work on together. Uh, what I had started to say before was that you can get to community-supported agriculture ideas from the principles of organic agriculture. In Japan, they created Teike before we had CSA here, and they've been doing it since the mid-1970s. And it's amazingly like community-supported agriculture. But we created our version without knowing about Teike. It wasn't until several years into community-supported agriculture that we learned about what the Japanese were doing. And uh, one of my anxieties this evening is that I know some Teike farmers who are just 100 kilometers from the uh, nuclear power plant that seems to be melting down as we speak. So, first let me tell you a little bit more about my farming. I started to farm um, when I was in my mid-30s uh, with some friends. I bought an old run-down dairy farm where the buildings had burned down and we reconstructed in, this was in Gill, Massachusetts, a town that's run by the, the, town, um, the town meeting. It's direct democracy rather than representative democracy. Uh, this is the house that we bought. It's a very beautiful place. And it was there that I really did my apprenticeship in organic agriculture. And then after nine years there, I moved to Rose Valley Farm in Rose, New York. Um, Rose is my, um, New York is my home state. I grew up in Croton on the Hudson, New York, which is a suburb of New York City. And uh, my parents not only were not farmers, but they never even gardened. They were rather astonished when they heard that I was going to become a farmer. But they were always very supportive of the things that I chose to do. And they said, well, as he wants to do it, it probably is a good thing to do. So in 1988-89, I moved to Rose Valley. And Rose Valley is in Wayne County. It's a part of New York that a lot of people don't know at all. It's about an hour from the city of Rochester. It's way out in the country. Um, it's not in the same county with the great Ithaca Farmer's Market. We tried selling at the Farmer's Market in the nearest town, Lyons. And if you sold $100 worth of stuff in a whole morning, you were doing really well. But usually, um, there wasn't very much of a market for our goods. We sold to food co-ops in Rochester, Syracuse, and Ithaca. But it was apparent in the late um, 80s and the very beginning of the 90s that our small farms were altogether likely to suffer the same kind of competition from California that conventional produce farms had had, um, and that we needed to find people who would be our loyal customers. And it was then that I heard about community-supported agriculture from my friend Robin Van Inn. Uh, this is the farm where I have been farming um, for the past 12 years, um, Peacework Farm, near Newark, New York, which is about 12 miles from Rose Valley. And here you can see our fields and the permanent beds and the hoop house setting out onions early in the morning. I hope my sound is better now. I'm trying to speak right into the microphone.
Luke, I'm trying to get it to go forward to the next slide, but it isn't moving. I get a sign called, there we go. Okay, this is a, an aerial view of our farm, and probably like uh, your small vegetable farms, it's a wonderful little patchwork, whereas the um, bigger corn and soybean farms look quite different from the air. Hmm. Can I? Hmm. There we go. Okay. So, in order to solve our marketing problem at Rose Valley Farm, we created the Genesee Valley Organic CSA with people in the city of Rochester. Um, The group that we worked with was a group called The Politics of Food. And together with Allison Clark, who was the uh, staff person of that organization, um, we formed uh, our little core group. And we decided right from members to participate in some way in the CSA. So we put up a few posters around the food co-op and a store that sold recycled things of different kinds in the city of Rochester. And we made contact with a group called the Human Ecology Action League. And we called people to a first meeting and gave them a brochure explaining what we intended to do. And at that meeting, we explained that we hoped that everybody would participate in some way. And they agreed to that. We said this was going to be an experiment. We'll reevaluate from time to time and adjust things so that it works for both the farmers and the people who join the farm. So right from the beginning, as you see in the bottom of the, the left-hand corner of the brochure, it says a consumer-farmer partnership. And that is what we have tried to have from the beginning. Members of the CSA would either be um, members of the core group that administer the project, or else they would participate in harvesting, transporting the food from the farm, the whole hour drive into the city, and then help with distribution um, in the city. The other side of our brochure. There you go. I'm so awkward with my left hand. Um, so the core group started as a small group of people, but it has grown to over 20, um, 25 members as the CSA has grown. Initially, that first year, we just had um, 29 families, 31 shares. Now we're up to 300 households who belong to our farm and our CSA. 40 of those households um, pick up at the farm, and all the others pick up at a food co-op in the city of Rochester called the Abundance Co-op. The core group, initially, um, I thought of it as the people who were helping me with my farming, I staffed the group, I recruited people to be on it, and for the first couple of years, I chaired all the meetings. And then a kind of little rebellion took place on the core, and one of the members, who's a very kind person who's serving as our treasurer, explained to me that it would be good if we all studied um, the resource manual for a living revolution, which has a good outline on how to run a meeting and how to come to consensus. And if we rotated the chairmanship of the meetings so that it wouldn't be my farm, but our CSA. And I rejoiced at that little revolution that took place. 
And that's the way we've run things ever since. The chair of the, we, we gather half an hour before the core meeting is supposed to start, and those people who want to um, help make up the agenda for the meeting, we have topics that we cover every time, so it's not a whole new thing each time. And we set the amount of time that we're going to spend on each of the items. The people who are on the core group are all people who have specific um, jobs that they have volunteered for in helping to run the CSA. So here you see some of the members of our core group who came out to the new farm when we moved from Rose Valley to Peacework Farm. The man with the bandana is Doug Cry, who was the farmer there. And we're all discussing what the arrangement would be between our farm and CSA and his farm. Here's a meeting of a core group from another CSA, their share farm in Missouri. Um, Tom Ruggieri was a member of our CSA, and he married Rebecca Graff, and they moved out to Iowa to Missouri, where they are farming together. So the members of our core group have jobs like this one. Here is Melissa. She's been a core member on and off for 21 years. And she's one of the people who oversees distribution. But in this picture, she is explaining to new members, who, new people who want to join, um, how the core works and how the CSA works. And here, other members of the core group are signing up new members. So the man with the gray shirt and the glasses is helping people sign their contracts. Um, the woman next to him is taking people's checks for the season. Um, up against the wall there, what they're doing is signing sheets where they commit to working um, three four-hour shifts at the farm. And at the sign-up meeting, they actually sign up for those dates. And two, two, hour, two and a half hour shifts on distribution, which takes place at the Abundance Co-op in the city of Rochester. And it's the members who work on it on the Thursday morning or Sunday morning who actually transport the food from the farm into the city and put it in a cooler that we have in the back room of the food co-op. The other jobs that members of the core group have are um, the treasurer, they collect the money from the members and then send the farm a check. The farm is in control of our own expenses for running the farm and paying ourselves and the people who work for us. But all of the CSA expenses are handled by the core group treasurer. There's a person who is the clerk of the CSA who takes the minutes at meetings and makes sure that all of the core positions are filled. Um, checks up with people who agree to do jobs to make sure that they're actually being done. We have a webmaster. We have a person who's like the first responder that new people call or people who are inquiring about information. We have someone who maintains the membership list. Um, there are three people who put out the newsletter, the person who edits it, the person who formats it, and a third person who sends it out. Um, there are a couple of um, fairly disabled people who have taken on the job of reminding the other members uh, with a telephone call or an email on the day that they're supposed to, the day before they're supposed to work at the farm or work in distribution. And then there are 10 people who share the job of overseeing distribution at the food co-op. And one of those people is the coordinator of the coordinators. At um, the other coordinators have all the materials they need that our rent to the co-op is paid and things like that. So everybody on the core group is there because they have a, a definite job. Um, there are three people who um, purchase products 
directly from other farms and they solicit orders from our members so that they, the members can get a good deal on such things as organic wine that neither the food co-op nor our farm produce organic grape juice. Some years they've done um, sheep cheese, um, they do blueberries, strawberries, things like that where they can get a good bulk price and the members can share in that bounty. The members who are not on the core group um, all work at the farm and help with distribution. So here is a Thursday or Sunday morning where my partner Amy is explaining to the people who are assembled there what the morning will look like, um, what they're going to do. And as you see, it's an assemblage of people of very different ages. There are children, there are animals. Um, we welcome everybody to the farm. We ask only that if anyone has a disability that they tell us about it, but because we can find jobs for everybody. So members help us with the harvesting. Here we're picking garlic greens early in the morning. Children are wonderful at picking things like peas, um, green beans, snow peas. A couple little boys picking up potatoes. This is actually a very old photo. And these two little boys are now college students. And for me, that's been one of the um, really enjoyable aspects of having children come out to the farm year after year, that I get to know them and I see them grow up. And we even have a few second generation families. Very few children like to weed. <clears throat> and when we work with members, we are careful to give them jobs that we know that they will enjoy. But this is one particular family um, that has a farm of its own where they have goats and they make goat cheese. And these six children will actually weed happily for half an hour and do a really good job. We work in all kinds of weather. If it's hot, if it's cold, we have instruction on our website and in our member guide telling people how to protect their bodies, what to wear, um, as you see, everybody's pretty well dressed with, with gloves and warm clothing and hats. We say if it's early on a Thursday or Sunday morning and you're supposed to work at the farm and you look out the window and you see that it's raining or snowing, don't call the farm to ask if we are working. We are working. Uh, the only thing that chases us out of the field is lightning and thunder. After all the uh, crops are harvested, some of the members help with washing things and packing them into boxes. This was a particularly mosquitoy morning, so you see that I have a mosquito net on. And then the last hour or so of that four hour work morning from 8 to noon, um, we do some job that requires a lot of hands. You see down in the forefront on the left, that's Greg. And he is working with a group of members who are planting garlic. That's a wonderful job to have many hands to do. At the end of the morning, we have a potluck picnic. The farm makes a great big salad, and then people bring things to eat. And on this particular morning, we had as guests a group of children from an organization in Rochester called Rochester Roots, where Jan McDonald, who's the woman who's looking at us um, in the gray shirt, um, teaches the children about growing food. They have gardens at a couple of the schools. They make some product uh, salves and other things that they sell. The children have the experience of growing food, selling the products, and Jan also does training for school teachers in how to run a garden and how to use a garden for um, all the different kinds of educational activities that you can have going on uh, 
um, with children outside. So after the picnic, we pack the food into the members' cars. We've gotten extremely good at putting a lot of boxes in small places. And they transport the food back into the city to a whole hour's drive to the Abundance Co-op. And there, as you see, there's a cooler that we built. <coughs> uh, the food is placed in the cooler so that um, the cool food that's either been in our cooler or washed in cool water and immediately put in a cooler stays cool until late in the afternoon when the members come who are in charge of distribution. We, the farmers, do not touch that distribution at all. We're still back at the farm, able to do more farming. Here you see one of the members of the core group instructing the other people about what they're supposed to be doing to get the food ready for the other members to pick up. The food is placed on tables in boxes. There are two different tables, one for the full shares, one for the partial shares. Each box has on it its label what's in the box and um, how many people are supposed to take, or if there's a choice. Um, we do regular um, surveys of our members at the end of the season to find out what they like or don't like. Um, the categories are, I was satisfied, I want more, I want less. Um, oh, no pictures. I can see the picture. Where did they go? Um, another category of the <clears throat> on the survey is um, I would like more so that I can put some up for the winter. And the final category is I didn't like it as a kid and I won't eat it now. And that way we learn what people's favorites are and what the things are that people hate. And if there's something that a lot of people really like, like Brussels sprouts, but about an equal number really hate, we give those things as a choice. We also have a share table where people can put things that they don't want and other people can take them. So here the table is all set up. Oh, no photos. Luke, what's going on? I see a photo. I'm sorry there's no photo mm. showing up for folks. Uh, I see photos as well. Um, does anyone else have problems seeing photos? Multiple attendees are typing, it says. Ah, some see them, some have them, some don't. Well, I guess I'll, I'll go on and hopefully <clears throat> the technical things will be worked out for everybody. Hmm. So the food is laid out on these tables and then members come and they assemble their own shares. We ask them to bring their own bags. Well, I guess it's creaky, but it is working. So I'll keep going here. Um, helping set up distribution is a job that is a very good job for involving children. Um, I did witness one hilarious scene when there was a, a young mother with a baby on her back, in a pack on her back, and the mother was putting onions in a scale, and every time she leaned over, the baby would take the onion out of the scale and throw it on the, on the ground. So not every job works for everybody, um, so you have to pay attention and give people the jobs that are suitable. Our farm isn't the only one that involves members in very significant ways. This is a scene from Live Power Community Farm out in California, Gloria and Steve Decatur. They use um, horses. Uh, 
live, that's their live power. And they have a lot of children come to their farm. As you see, the children are learning how to do, how to do plowing with the horses. Live power is four and a half hours drive from San Francisco, where most of the members of their CSA live. So Live Power has a truck that, as a backhaul, takes their shares into the city. And then the members themselves are entirely in charge of the distribution. This is a scene from a Teike farm in Japan, where members are helping harvest rice. And those Teike farms not only provide their members with vegetables, but they usually also um, give them rice. Some of them have wheat, miso, soy sauce, um, peanuts, sweet potatoes. Uh, those farms sometimes associate with one another so that the TK farm provides the entire diet for the people who are members. And this is a shot from Vermont Valley Farm in, I'm sorry, yeah, Vermont Valley Farm in Wisconsin. It's Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, Vermont Valley. Um, Dave and Barb Perkins. Their system is remarkable in this way, that they recruit 50 of their members to be their entire harvest crew. Um, they do over 900 shares in and around the city of Madison, Wisconsin. The 50 people that they recruit each work four hours a week for 20 weeks doing the harvesting, and Barb manages that harvest crew. And this is a shot of uh, the Temple Wilton Farm which, along with Indian Lion Farm, was one of the very first CSAs in this country. Temple Wilton and Kimberton Farm in Pennsylvania have maybe the most remarkable way of involving their members. But instead of charging a flat fee or even a sliding scale fee, which is what we do, um, Temple Wilton assembles all of its members before the beginning of the season presents the farm budget to them, and members place bids as to how much they can pay for their shares. If the bids add up to cover the entire budget, that's the end of the story, and everybody goes home. Apparently, it was harder to do this at first, but now um, members are really used to it. It just takes 45 minutes, and people actually take amounts that are the amounts that they need. So Temple Wilton and Kimberton have totally broken the connection between dollars and pounds of food. There are a couple of really excellent um, networking groups that support CSA development. Just Food in New York City is one of them. Over the past 12 years, they have helped in the development of um, 100 CSAs. This is a shot of the pickup for one of the CSAs for Roxbury Farm, which was the very first CSA in New York City. Um, Roxbury now has 1,200 members. Um, they have about half a dozen pickup points, three upstate New York, and three in New York City in these rather um, city-like surroundings where the farm leaves the vegetables and the members come and pick them up. So once again, the distribution is entirely handled by members of the core group. Some of the city core groups um, are connected to or projects of social service organizations of different kinds. And some are just groups of citizens who like the idea of connecting with a farm within two or an hour, two or three hours drive at the most of New York City. And many of these CSAs have uh, either revolving loan funds or subsidized shares so that they're able to involve um, 
very low income people, and some of them have um, varying sizes of the shares so that senior citizens can participate or um, disabled people of different kinds who live in very small apartments and have tiny refrigerators. Just Food on their website, it's justfood.org, has a resource section where they have several fine um, uh, videos about CSA. And they also have a guide to forming a core group and a toolkit that you can purchase, which is as thorough an exposition of all the different things that a core group might need to do in order to make a CSA successful. It's a really excellent resource. Um, because it's in the city of New York, there's a whole section, for example, on uh, the precincts of the police and how to contact them in case your farmer is arrested or given a ticket um, driving into the city to deliver the shares. Shameless advertisement um, in terms of resources. My book, Sharing the Harvest, A Citizen's Guide to Community-Supported Agriculture, has an extensive resource section um, for listings of many CSAs around the country. You can go to localharvest.org. Um, as soon as my arm recovers, I'm going to be taking the resource section of Sharing the Harvest and putting it on the website of the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York. That's www.nofanewyork.org. Um, so you will be able to access that resource list. And I hope to, um, it's nofany.org. It's not New York all the way written out. That's better. There we go. We call it nofanny. Um, It'll, it'll probably be another two weeks before I get that up there. But um, I hope to regularly update that resource list so that we'll, it will be available to people um, all over the country who want to do CSAs. These are hands of the people who work at uh, Vermont Valley. They kind of match the knees that we saw earlier, the muddy knees. Um, but speaking of resources, if any of you knows French, there's a, another really excellent CSA support organization in Quebec called Equiterre, E-Q-U-I-T-E-R-R-E, -E -E, um, which has magnificent materials about CSA. Some of it's translated into English. A lot of it's in French. But they have helped in the development of about 100 CSAs in the province of Quebec. And that is something that an organization like Practical Farmers of Iowa might want to take on by helping citizens or community organizations form core groups and then link those up with the farms that want to do CSA. By providing local, fresh, clean, healthy food for people, one of the things that we are doing is building social capital. And I think that's a really important concept to understand. It's support and understanding for our work, but it's also something that can translate into either resources or physical assistance for us, and sometimes financial support for a farm. Our piecework farm initially was on land that we rented from Doug Cry, the man whose photo you saw earlier in this uh, farminar. He died of cancer. And then his wife offered to sell the farm to us. But instead of buying it ourselves, um, a couple of the members of our CSA were also members of the board of the Genesee Land Trust. And they proposed that we work with the land trust to gain long-term access to the land. 
And what we ended up doing after a lot of discussion was having a preserving piecework campaign. Members of the CSA contributed money, and in 14 months they contributed all of the money that was needed for the Genesee Land Trust to purchase the farm from the Cry family. And then the Land Trust leased it back to our farm with a 25-year rolling lease. They decided to do that rather than a 99-year lease. This was 25 years. Uh, if we want to leave, we have to give them 25 years notice. If they want to get rid of us, they have to give us 25 years notice. And the lease rolls over every year so that it's always 25 years into the future. And the process of that rolling over involves the farmers going to meet with the board of the land trust. And that way, we keep in really good touch with the land trust board. Um, we're able to explain to them what we've done that year. Many of the land trust board have now become members of our CSA. And that way, it's a really good working relationship. Because there have been other farms that have been on land trust land where the board and the farmers have not kept in good touch with one another and things have not gone as well as they have for us. Other farms have done similar things. Roxbury Farm members um, contributed money for buying some of the land and the farmers bought some. Uh, Live Power Community Farm, their San Francisco members contributed the money to pay for a conservation easement on the land that um, the Decaters are using. And the Decaters themselves paid for the farm value of that land. Uh, and there, um, uh, the, the conservation easement on their land is held by an organization called Equity Trust, which is an important group for you to all know about. Equity Trust um, has a project in supporting CSAs in getting long-term uh, secure access to land. And they also have a revolving loan fund that works in this way. Your members can lend you money, but through Equity Trust. So they lend the money to Equity Trust's fund earmarked for your farm, you can then borrow that money to use for making improvements on your farm and then pay it back to Equity Trust. But by Equity Trust serving as the, um, the middle person in that deal, um, should you be late in your payments or something like that, you won't spoil your relationship with the members of your CSA. Uh, a few farms have sold shares in advance in order to accumulate capital for improvements that they wanted to make. Um, <clears throat> that way, they sell two or three years of shares and get that chunk of money, which has allowed them to either build a barn or buy a piece of equipment. So there are many different ways of translating social capital into um, real money that you can use to um, develop your farm in the way that you feel it needs to be. Um, the farmer who made um, the real dirt on Farmer John, if you haven't seen that movie, you uh, have a great um, pleasure awaiting you. I think most of it actually is on YouTube these days. But it's John Peterson, who's in Caledonia, um, Illinois. And members of his CSA um, pooled their money and purchased the land next to his, land that had belonged to his family's farm, but which they had had to sell, which was actually foreclosed on um, maybe 15 years ago. And now the farm has backed the use of it, and it's allowed them to expand. So the last thing that I wanted to say about member involvement in your CSA is that there are these wonderful people out there. Um, there are many pressures on people's time and resources. But I will put up the members of my CSA against the members of anybody else's CSA in terms of 
busyness and overcommitment and children and jobs and all those other things, but they have made being members of our CSA a high priority in their lives and something in which they involve their members of their family through which they help educate their children. And they say that they just appreciate so much not only the food, but the opportunity to be involved in something that is totally positive, that is helping to make our Earth a better place. So if you go to the members whom you haven't involved before, and you say to them, will you please help me on my farm? I, I don't have enough time to do everything that I need to do. All those people will be too busy. They have too many other things to do. But if instead you say, this CSA is a really important project in creating sustainability for our world. It's something that we are inventing and developing uh, as we go along. It has room for everybody's creativity. And I invite you to join me in working on this project. And when you invite people that way, suddenly they do have the time. And you will find that um, people will contribute, a, contribute resources and ideas way beyond anything that you ever imagined. So I would be very happy now to answer questions. The Equity Trust website, I believe it's just equitytrust.org. Do people have other questions? More information on land trusts. There's a whole network of land trusts all over the country. I don't know what land trusts you have there in Iowa, but I would imagine um, you can either go to the National Alliance of Land Trusts, which probably has a listing, or um, just Google Land Trust and your area and see what you get. Nature Conservancy is a national organization. More likely, you would want to work with a local land trust. Most of them have a territory that they operate in. Uh, here in New York State, the Genesee Land Trust covers Monroe and Wayne counties. Then farther south, there's the Ithaca Land Trust. Farther west, there's the Western New York Conservancy. So there are many different land trusts. Um, there are also two different kinds of land trusts. There are conservation land trusts, which typically preserve farmland or open space. Um, land for birds, things like that. More and more of the land trusts are catching on that it's not enough to just preserve farmland, that you have to work with the farmers in some active way to preserve the farms as well. Uh, American Farmland Trust is another um, national organization that's dedicated to preserving farmland. And they may be able to tell you what land trust um, covers your area. So that's, um, I think their website is AmericanFarmers.org, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't have that in front of me, I'm sorry. The other kind of land trust is a community land trust. Um, community land trusts typically help low-income people in cities um, purchase housing where the building itself is sold to the individuals, but the land, re the land under the building remains in the hands of the land trust. And the lease that the people sign keeps that housing affordable so that the value doesn't appreciate. There's no bubble in community land trust land. And when we wrote the lease for our um, 
our use of uh, the piecework farm land with the Genesee Land Trust, we borrowed um, clauses from community land trust leases so that our farm and our farmland will remain affordable for people who are farming into the future. So here I see another question. Do your do in the CSA also? The way our CSA works is everybody contributes. So nobody pays more or less depending upon the amount of work that they do. The only people who are paid are the farmers and the people who work on our farm. Um, people in our CSA pay on a sliding scale. We share our farm budget with the members and we explain that we need at least a certain amount, which is the median of uh, the, amount, the amounts that we um, offer the share prices for. So for several years, we needed an average of $480. But members could pay as little as 240 in food stamps or as much as $680 and get the same amount of food. And we didn't verify that in any way. Our concern only was that it averaged out to the 480 that we needed to cover our budget. And somehow, serendipitously, year after year, uh, it averages out. That year it was $480.43. There are farms that um, offer working shares for a reduced price. The hands that we see are the people who work for Vermont Valley uh, Community Farm. And those people work in exchange for their share. So they get the full value of their share for their work. In other CSAs, um, with a smaller work requirement for a working share, um, it would be a smaller amount deducted from the full uh, fee cost. But what you have to be careful about is that it amounts to minimum wage per hour. Otherwise, you will be in trouble um, legally. OK, so how do you deal with dominant personalities when you have so many people working on the farm at the same time? Pessimists, of it all, et cetera. Um, the members, when they come out to work on our farm, all work together with us as farmers and with our interns. And it's pretty clear that each work crew is headed up either by a farmer or by the intern. And over the 22 years that we have been doing that, there have really been only a few personalities that have been um, impossible to, to take. Uh, there was one man who heard me and a, another and a member talking about France. And he said, oh, the Frenchies, where would they be without the American doughboy? And everybody kind of looked over at him like, what is he talking about? <coughs> Excuse me. And that man um, was offensive in other ways and ended up leaving the CSA. And there was another man who initially was doing a really sloppy job putting bunches of Swiss chard together. And I pointed out to him that that was going to be his food, and he might want to do a better job of it. And he suddenly kind of shaped up, and he said, oh, you farmers, you're professionals, and I need to take this more seriously. And then he did a really good job for the rest of the morning. We have found a few people who really can't do certain jobs. So when those people come back after a few times, we're able to identify something that they can do. Like there's one man who's a very brilliant mathematician, but cannot for the life of him make a bunch. But he's really good at washing potatoes, so that works out fine. Um, I haven't run into any bad pessimists. Um, most people are really respectful and really want to do a good job. Sometimes they talk too much and you have to say, excuse me, uh, we need to move to something else, or this is how you do something. Um, 
that working with all those people has brought many more benefits than problems. I have gotten to know just several hundred really fine people and some of my very closest friends now are people I've met because they're the people that I have fed for many years. More questions? Keep them coming. Well, let me talk a little bit about core groups. Um, it's something that I think is really valuable for a farm to have a core of people who are especially committed among the members of your CSA. Some core groups are um, kind of informal and are just um, people who you can go to for special advice or to talk through diff difficult problems that the farm may encounter. Um, it's a way of having members who you know, give you the temperature of what's going on with the other members and can give you advice about how to adjust things, either adjust the share quantities or the prices or things like that. But a lot of CSAs that have core groups have working core groups that take real responsibility for either particular jobs or segments of the work. Like the city core groups for Just Food um, are responsible for the distribution setup, finding the place where the CSA does its distribution, overseeing the distribution, and often they are also responsible for um, finding money to subsidize shares for low-income members or setting up revolving loan funds. And that was a great discovery that the Just Food people made, that you could create a revolving loan fund, a sum of money uh, that could be either fundraised for, or in some cases, CSAs have gotten that money from uh, uh, nutrition programs, government programs. And then uh, the farmer can be paid up front when we really need the money. And then the members can pay in through the season as they can, so it allows lower income people to participate in a more comfortable way. OK, here's another question. How do you build your relationships with the members in the first years so you can be in a position to ask for big and bold help? Well, if you start out with having a core group and with saying that there is going to be member participation, that's probably easier than switching from no participation to a lot of participation. But a number of CSAs have taken the page in my book where I list all of the jobs that have to be done to make a CSA function. And they've gone to their members and said, look, if we want to make this sustainable, I would really appreciate it if you could identify the jobs on this list that you could do and that you would commit to doing. And that's a way of uh, getting people to take on a commitment. There are sure to be people who are better at putting out a newsletter, um, maintaining a website, possibly collecting money from other members, um, things like that. that than you are. Um, it's very hard for me to ask people for money, but we have regularly had members who are willing to call other members and say, hey, you're behind on your payments. We have to keep our farmers well paid, so please come across with your money. Um, you build those relationships by giving people real responsibilities and then giving them some freedom to do the job. It does mean that we are giving up some responsibility for, uh, for our, sh our farm business. We're sharing it with other people. So you have to be willing to swing with that. Um, and just trust that the group process is going to bring you somewhere better than where you could get on your own. Um, 
there has to be some leeway for different people to do a job in a different way. One newsletter editor will do it a little differently than another. But that's what makes the job creative and interesting to new people. So how do you qualify to accept food stamps for CSA shares? Um, you go down to the nearest USDA office and you can apply for um, the approval to accept food stamps. They will not allow food stamps to be paid in advance of receiving food. Um, the most they will um, allow food stamps to be paid every two weeks. So it means that the members who are on food stamps have to be on a different um, payment schedule than those members who might be paying you the whole amount up front. And that is where a revolving loan fund might come in, or just being flexible, or taking a certain percentage of the members who have food stamps. Um, I would suggest that you don't explain too much about what you're doing to USDA and simply say that you're a farm and you're selling produce and you want to accept um, SNAP payments from low-income people. Usually they may come and uh, inspect your farm. Those applications, at least when I made one out, are written as though you are a store and not a farm. But just fill it in as a farm. Things that don't apply say don't apply. And they will um, grant you um, authority to accept the food stamps. In the past few years, um, it's been the Morgan uh, Chase Morgan Trust Company that handles the food stamp payments. So if you're only taking food stamps occasionally, you can have a, a food stamp authorization money um, number, excuse me, and you will contact the bank and tell them that you've received um, payments, and they will transfer the money from the uh, food stamp account to your account. If you are accepting um, food stamps on a regular basis, they will actually supply you with a free EBT swipe machine. It has to be plugged in, and it has to have your uh, plug into your telephone. Um, we got one for free. Uh, farmers markets and uh, community organizations can sometimes um, get access to EBT machines. So, is there produce grown last year that wasn't a hit to not be grown this year? Yes, over the years, there have been a few things that we have dropped from our list of crops. Uh, we used to do um, turnip greens. Now we just do turnips. Um, I love experimenting with new crops. And um, so I got our members to try cilantro. It made a big hit the first year or two. You know, we gave them recipes for salsa and things like that, and people took it once or twice sort of reluctantly, and then it caught on. And now there are people who want cilantro as many times a season as we can provide it. Um, I tried another uh, a Japanese herb called shungiku. It bombed. Um, people didn't like it, and so after two years, we gave it up. <laughs> OK. Ah, I see there's information. I think that's information on um, how to get EBT. Do people have other questions? Another remarkable way of uh, involving your members is Quail Hill Farm in Amagansett, Long Island. Uh, all of their members come out to the farm and pick their own shares. Um, do farm volunteers bring their own equipment on work days? No, they don't. Um, we only ask that people bring work gloves, their own hat, uh, snack food, something to share in the potluck. If they bring their children to make sure that they have snacks for their children, 
sunscreen, um, insect repellent if they use it, changes of clothing. Um, it's often cooler at the farm than it is in the city, so we advise people to bring many layers of clothing. But we supply knives, baskets, things like that, all the equipment that they would use. And an important aspect of that is we have a very large um, liability um, coverage as part of our um, farm insurance policy. I think if you go for liability as a separate thing, it's more expensive, but if you tack it onto your farm um, insurance, it was I think, 200 and some dollars for um, two million dollars worth of liability coverage. We, the deal that we have with the insurance company is that we're a special kind of you pick. We assure them that the members aren't exposed to pesticides, don't climb ladders, don't use any machinery. So um, we qualify for um, the lowest uh, expense you pick liability coverage. That's a very good question. What are the decisions that the member core groups do, do not have control over? It? Um, we divide up the areas of responsibility. The farmers are in charge of the farm. We make all of the decisions on what seeds we buy, where we buy them, how we plant them, where we plant them, how we lay out the fields, how we rotate the crops. Um, how we make our compost, what equipment we purchase, how we maintain it. Everything having to do with running the farm is in our um, area of decision making. Once the food leaves the farm and goes to the CSA, the, mem the core group and the members have a say in how that is done. So they have a say in um, what's in the shares, the size of the different, the size of the full and partial shares, um, the price of the shares. We negotiate the number of shares so that we have enough to cover the budget. The salaries for the farmers are actually set by us, the farmers. Um, we did not have health care initially or a pension fund. And it was by one year presenting two different budgets to the core group. Um, that they came to the really full realization that we really didn't have health care or a pension fund, and that they only needed to increase their share fee by $1 a week in order to cover our health care costs. So they voted to raise the price on themselves in order that we could have health care and $1,000 a year towards a pension fund per farmer. Does that help? We've never had members try and charge in and tell us how to run the farm. They're really very respectful of our work. Um, in the newsletter that we put out six times a year, we have um, updates from the farm where we explain in great detail how we, you know, what's been happening with the weather, with the crops, with our um, interns and ourselves and our lives. So the people who are members of our farm know an awful lot about us. Um, the succession plan is that um, Greg and Amy, who have been my partners, are now really the managers of the farm. And I am retiring from full-time farming, and I'm just becoming a part-time helper. And Greg and Amy hope to recruit some younger people over the next few years to take over after them. That's our succession plan. Um, we formed an LLC so that we would have control over who the farmers were, and it wouldn't be up to the land trust to make that decision. So there, the agreement between the land trust is between the land trust and the LLC, rather than with the individual farmers. And in that way, the LLC um, maintains the uh, responsibility for providing the succession on the farm.
We don't have a CSA community space on the farm. Um, there are some farms that do that, farms that are closer to where most of their members live. Um, for our farm, it's a whole hour's drive from uh, Rochester, where most of our members are. And we occasionally have other events at the farm. We have an annual May Day party, and quite a few members do come out to that on May 1st and dance around the maypole and go for a walk in the woods and look at the wildflowers and have a tour of the farm. But when we've tried to have additional events at the farm, attendance has been very poor. Dan Kaplan, who um, runs Brookfield Farm in Massachusetts, said that CSA members love to hear about their farm having events, but they don't often like to go to them. The involvement in the farm and getting the shares in itself is uh, plenty for people's lives, and that's the community part that's important to them. Um, dances and other things are are less important. Um, one or two events at the farm um, each season is probably enough. Um, Brookfield has a pumpkin harvest day. Uh, there are farms that have a garlic harvest day where members come out and help um, harvest the garlic and then can make garlic braids for themselves. Some farms have um, a potato harvest day at uh, Quail Hill, I believe they do that, and lots of members come out and help them dig the potatoes. A new CSA farm in our area is planning to have kind of a, uh, <clears throat> a portable movie screen that she can put up and show some good food movies at her farm and have a party that way. So do people have any more questions? Ben Saunders, I'm waiting for your question. <laughs> The hands that we see from Vermont Valley, they figured out that if you pay people in produce, you don't have to pay FICA. You don't have to pay Social Security for people who you're paying in kind. And that's totally legal, as long as it amounts to um, minimum wage per hour. Our CSA does not include meat and eggs. For two years, a farm up the road from us offered um, chicken and egg shares to our members. And then they decided that it was actually easier for them, for the farmers, to do orders every two weeks. So what they do is they come into our distribution area every two weeks and Members can order chicken and eggs from them, and then the delivery comes two weeks later. But there are meat CSAs, there are meat and egg CSAs, there are CSAs that include eggs along with the vegetable shares. Some CSAs include fruit with the vegetables. Some offer separate shares of fruit or vegetables. There are all kinds of combinations that you can do depending upon what is convenient for you. Um, I know of a couple farms that assemble fruit shares that they buy from other farms, but then supply to their members. And um, that way, the farm actually makes some money on selling those shares. We do survey our members. Um, every year, we do an end of the season survey, as well as um, uh, vegetable questionnaire that I talked about a little bit earlier. That survey is sent out um, electronically to members. It's posted on the website. Um, they mail the answers back into um, us, the farmers. And we have 
generally looked over, looked them over, and um, compiled the answers. But I recently learned how to do a survey monkey, and that's a very easy way of doing a survey. And the survey monkey um, instrument um, does all of the um, compilation for you. You can see the comments. You can't see who made the comments, but um, I think it's surveymonkey.com, maybe the website. It's a very um, handy, quick way of doing a survey. Even someone with minimal computer skills like me is able to do that. What big shifts have we seen in our CSA? Well, the membership has grown steadily. Um, over the years until we hit a point about oh, seven years ago where we said that's the number we want. And instead of getting bigger, we're going to try and do this better. Um, we're going for equilibrium, for balance, instead of constant growth. Um, we would like to improve the quality and not the quantity. We have. Um, Early on, we, we did a retreat with as many members as would come. There were perhaps 30 people who came to a day-long retreat to discuss how we could make the CSA sustainable, both for them and for us. And we got a lot of very good ideas from that. Uh, a big change that's happened in our area is that we, used, we were the first CSA. Then for quite a few years, there were just two our farm and the Porter farm. We required work. The Porter farm didn't. So when people said to the Porters, can we come work on your farm? They said, maybe you want to join um, the Genesee Valley Organic CSA. And when people said to us, can we pay less so that we don't have to work? We said, well, maybe you would like to join the Porters. But now there are 22 CSAs in our area. And NOFA New York is sponsoring a CSA fair in Rochester that will happen in two weeks. So that we get publicity for the CSA concept, and we're going to have all the CSA come. And people can get to know all of the different choices that they have. Our idea is rather than have the multiple CSAs compete with one another, to increase the size of the CSA pie for everybody. And we're having a series of fairs like that across the state in Buffalo area, the Rochester area, the Albany area. Um, Just Food does a CSA fair conference in New York City. And there's another one in Ithaca. The members of the core group do not get any special compensation for their work, because everybody works. Members have the choice of being on the core group or coming out and helping with farm work and helping with distribution. So the amount of work that people do isn't exactly the same. Um, and some years, some people will do much less because of circumstances in their lives. But usually every year, there are a few people who do extra work. Um, and we just don't worry about that. It evens out in the long run. Um, we are not required to be GAP certified in order to accept food stamps. That might be a change that's coming down the line, but I haven't heard that that would be required. As I explained, there are CSAs that compensate members for doing work, um, editing the newsletter, or taking charge of distribution. Um, CSAs hire somebody. But in ours, it's a, we explain to people that this is a co-op, and we all work together, and we count on everybody's contribution and people coming through with what they commit to doing. Over the years, we've only met what they promised to do. Um, one person called me up. Um, around Christmas one year and said, you know, I feel terrible. I didn't do my work shift um, this season. Is there anything I can do over the winter in order to make up for it? So we always have things for people to do. And I appreciated the honesty. And that worked out really well. 
there have been, I think, two people whom we have asked, not encouraged to join again, because they were, um, they had a bad attitude and didn't do what they had committed to do. But they actually sign a contract which says that they will make a certain payment and do a certain amount of work. And in that contract, the farm commits to providing seven to 12 items a week for the full shares, or four to five items a week for the partial shares. And we all agree to share the risk of doing this together. Well, if you've run out of questions, I appreciate your um, attention this evening. And I wish you all the very best of luck. And uh, Luke and Sally have my email. Please feel free to send questions if you have them for me, and I'll do my best to try and answer answer. Get your questions about CSA answered. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for sharing. I really appreciate your time and your slides are so beautiful. And I uh, wanted to encourage everyone to join us next time, next week, for another Farminar on profitable grass-based livestock. And I uh, hope you all have a really great night. Thanks a lot. Good night.